constitutional <laughs> because the laws intend to require citizens to apply the Constitution. I think that's kind of a narrow view of what Constitution Day can mean. I think to consider the significance of the Constitution is, the not, is not the same thing as to applaud it blindly. Indeed, I would say that democracy is the only form of government that permits itself to be criticized publicly. And in the U.S., it's the Bill of Rights that grants U.S. citizens the ability to engage in just this kind of public debate, to critique and defend the U.S. government and the U.S. Constitution. And I think that might be reason enough for the Constitution to be praised, but it also permits, and some might say it even demands, that the Constitution and the U.S. government be challenged and even criticized, perhaps regularly. To do otherwise, to presume that because my right to free speech is protected, that there's little for me then to say, is to take a risk with American democracy and with the Constitution. Seth's talk today invites just this kind of critical thinking about the Constitution and the U.S. government. The talk is entitled, provocatively enough, I've actually made mention of this several times in my classes, How to Kill an American, Civil Liberties, the War on Terror, and the Case of Anwar al awlaki Seth's talk considers the constitutionality of the U.S. government's actions in targeting for killing Anwar al who was a U.S. citizen, but who was also a leading figure in Al-Qaeda. Seth himself might need no introduction, uh, but permit me to mention that Seth is an award-winning teacher um, in international relations in the Department of Politics and Government, of which we are very proud. He is the author of several articles, and most recently of a book entitled Restoring the Balance, War Powers, and Energy. I tend not to like electronic notifications, but the other terms are. Thanks very much for coming. It is nice to see so many people here willing to take a we certainly proved during the last sunny days that we have here in Tacoma uh, and spend it thinking about the Constitution. Um, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher once said that Europe was created by history, but the United States was created by philosophy. And I think that really builds nicely on Professor Kessel from Mars, because that's exactly, I think, what's so important and so wonderful in a way about this country is that we are a country that's rooted in what are ultimately very, very profound debates about what the meaning of liberty is and how we think about these, these very complicated concepts, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, uh, and other basics of liberty, some of which I'll talk uh, on today, and how we put these into practice in a very large democracy of people who all believe different things and have their own interpretations. So, I mean, uh, I think many of us, and certainly myself and Professor Kessel, spend more than one day thinking about these issues. But at least uh, it is nice to see so many people, and I think it's important that we do take at least a day to think about what this means in the context uh, of our own lives. Uh, this year in particular, given the proximity of Constitution Day to the 10 year anniversary of September 11th, um, when I was asked uh, if I was interested in doing this talk, it immediately made me start, start to think about the implications of what happened, particularly after September 11th, uh, and what we now colloquially call the War on Terror. Uh, and the issues that that raises for civil liberties uh, and the Constitution itself. Uh, the work that I've been doing recently engages a lot of these issues and how the war on terror has interfered and uh, bumped up against with uh, these uh, civil liberties. Questions such as the legality of, uh, of warrantless wiretapping, <coughs> the implications of the Patriot Act, the, the right of the government to detain um, sometimes American citizens but people pursuant to uh, dealing with of terrorism. But quickly I started to think about one issue that I think is most likely the most problematic of all, which would be targeted killing, something that has been in the news a lot recently as the United States begins to rely more on the use of surveillance and drones to take out uh, senior members of Al-Qaeda. And in fact, you might have even read last week there's now a debate in the government about whether or not the United States is allowed to expand targeted killing. Right now it's really been it's really been sort of focused on the senior members of Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. And there's now a debate whether or not you can even start just killing low-level, sort of what we would call operatives or foot soldiers, right? So sort of something like file of Al-Qaeda. So this is a major component of the 
United States identify an American citizen for targeted killing without essentially any kind of review or appeals process, because of course there is none. And, well, it's not quite true, but there is none. I'll discuss that in a little bit, right? But President Obama has added this man to a list right, of people who can essentially be killed at any time, in any place, without any kind of warning, without any attempt to arrest. And there is essentially, there's no judicial oversight, and there's, no due, there's nothing that we would refer to as due process, and there's almost no oversight. The only oversight that exists is when the President decides to add an American citizen the National Security Council, which is the President's essentially National Security Advisory Board, basically looks at the person and, justify, and decides whether or not the President's um, designation is justified. But that's the only thing that even approaches any kind of due process. All right, so before I get into uh, the sort of the mechanics of how to think about this question, let's just uh, talk a little bit about Al Waki himself. Right? Let's sort of give you his background. Right, right now, uh, Amir Al Waki is a senior recruiter, motivator, and propagandist for Al Qaeda in the Arabian which is one of the franchises of Al-Qaeda. After September 11th, Al-Qaeda, which was a centralized organization, has begun to fracture and has created a bunch of, I like to call them almost franchises, right? Where, where people basically sort of buy an Al-Qaeda franchise and they start operating and, uh, and now they're all of a sudden a member of, uh, they're a part of Al-Qaeda. And to what degree they're a part of is actually a very important question, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, in a drone strike against a member of Al-Qaeda 
was believed to be the planner of the attacks in 2000 against the U.S. as a whole. Hijazi, the American citizen, was the alleged ringleader of the Lackawanna 7, a group of Muslims in Lackawanna, Buffalo, I think that's what I'm saying, Buffalo, who uh, pled guilty to providing material support to Al-Qaeda and cooperated with local authorities and provided valuable intelligence on Al-Qaeda. So here's an American citizen who was coordinating with a group of Al-Qaeda operatives in the United States. He happened to be accidentally killed in a drone strike in Yemen, but what if he had been in the United States? Was he targeted? In June 2010, the Deputy National Security Advisor of the United States said there are dozens of U.S. persons who have joined international terrorist organizations who are in different parts of the world, and they are very concerning to us, right, which is diplomatic speak for we would like to kill them. <laughs> On December, in December 2010, the New York Times further revealed that there are at least three other Americans who are on a targeted kill list. So this is not just an isolated question, and we don't know who these other three are. Right? We don't know where they are, we don't know who they are. In fact, they probably don't even know who they are. Right? They, the government is, un, is not under an obligation to inform you that it intends to kill you. <laughs> and this actually becomes very important because as we'll see, uh, the fact that Al-Waqi knows about it is, uh, is actually part of the, uh, the argument that we talk about. Right? So this is not an isolated question. Right? There are at least four American citizens, if not more, right? and dozens who are concerned with the security environment, who are on a targeted kill list. So let me lay out the basic arguments as they stand right now for whether or not the United States can do this. Now, you may be aware, if you follow this stuff as closely as I do, that there was actually a legal case. The father of Anwar al awlaki supported by the American Civil Liberties Union, sued the United States government saying that this is something that we can't do. Uh, the case has been dismissed, right, but as uh, students of constitutional law like, uh, are likely to know, U.S. courts do everything they can to avoid resolving suits that, that are in the area of national security. Right? They don't like, the courts don't like to decide what the president can and cannot do. Now, if you're a critic of American presidential, of expanded presidential power, this is really dangerous, right? Because, of course, you would like the courts to define what the president can and cannot do. The courts don't like to do this. So this case was dismissed on something called standing. Standing is a technical legal term. It basically says, in order to sue somebody, you have to be materially harmed by the action in question. Right? So the father of Anwar al awlaki is not being targeted, therefore he does not have standing to sue the government against the targeting of his son. Only Anwar al awlaki himself can do that, right? Because he's the right? And it's sort of a practical reason, right? Otherwise everybody would be suing everybody all the time for all sorts of things that didn't impact them. So you know, we have this thing called standing, which says only if you were the person who is impacted by the, the act in question, can you sue, right? And so the court found that his father did not have standing. And one of the reasons it found that is because the U.S. government, as I sort of hinted at before, has said that if al waqi turns himself in, it will not kill him. It will accept his, uh, his surrender and it will allow him to uh, a, uh, challenge and, uh, and initiate this kind of lawsuit. So basically he said, look, the government said, we will let him turn himself in, he can come to an embassy, he can present himself to anybody, he can turn himself in, we will let him then sue, process, and challenge his uh, designation. Okay. So the case is dismissed, right? So here are the two arguments as they stand, right? The United States basically made the argument that the president has the inherent authority to protect the country against the enemies of state that threaten it. And because the war, what, and because the, the war, this is a little bit complicated, and I'm not going to get into all of it, but basically, the president claims that the authorizing, the authorization that he that he enjoys to pursue Al Qaeda is connected to something called the authorization of the use of military force that was passed by the United States Congress on September 18, 2001, in the aftermath of the New York City and Washington D.C. attacks. This basically authorized the president to go after Al Qaeda, and it did so in a way uh, that didn't put very many limits or boundaries on what the president could use. The president is saying, "Okay, Congress has authorized me to use force." against Al-Qaeda. This guy's a member of Al-Qaeda. I'm the president. I'm the commander-in-chief. It's my job to protect the country. I can kill him. Right? The ACLU, which I'll sort of use as the proxy for the, for the anti-argument because they weren't actually part of the case. They filed supporting views, but they essentially made this kind of argument. Made two arguments. One, that Al-Qaeda in the Iranian Peninsula is not Al-Qaeda. It's a separate organization. And the president is only authorized to go after members of Al-Qaeda itself. So basically they're saying, look, this is a different party, right? So after September 11th, the president got authorization to go after the Taliban and, and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Right? But not anybody anywhere who's a member of some kind of terrorist organization. That's a different thing and would require different legal, um, different legal rules. 
And so therefore, if he's not a member of Al-Qaeda, if you can't think of, um, of Anwar al-Awlaki as a member of Al-Qaeda and therefore covered by the AUMF of 2001, you can't kill him. Second, if you don't buy this argument, then he's an American citizen. And American citizens have protections in the Constitution, uh, which I will uh, outline in a second. They have protections in the Constitution that you can't simply discard. Um, the Constitution applies extraterritorially, which means that you, as citizens, I apologize if not everyone in this room is an American citizen, they don't know, but as an American citizen, when you leave the country, the Constitution still, to some degree, protects you. To a different degree, you're in the country, but there are still constitutional protections that exist when you leave the country. So even though al he might be in Yemen, and he might be a terrorist, and he might be plotting to kill people, he's still an American citizen, and the Constitution protects him from certain things, and gives him certain rights. The Constitution applies to citizens abroad. So these are the two basic arguments that I will sort of walk us through. Let me, I'm going to lay out now three ways, I think categories of ways to think about this question, and then I will, I will then sort of explore them in reverse order. The first is the constitutional protection question. There are two parts of the Constitution that are particularly relevant to this question of targeted killing, the fourth and the fifth amendments, which are probably pretty important amendments. Right? The fourth amendment tells us <laughs> that, uh, the fourth amendment tells us that uh, that's, that's uh, seizure. Right? It's, it's, the fourth amendment includes the clauses against um, uh, unwarranted search and seizure without probable cause. The Fourth Amendment tells us that seizure, well, actually, there's a case, Tennessee versus Gardner in 1985, that expands and says that the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable search and seizure includes killing, right? Because it's a way of the government to seize you, right? It seizes you by killing you. <laughs> so seizure by killing is subject to Fourth Amendment protections, right? The reasonable part, when it says we, maybe we're, we should be free from unreasonable uh, search and seizure, the reasonable standard requires probable cause. So without probable cause, right, probable cause can only be determined through a judicial uh, process, right? That's the process of getting a warrant, where you go before a judge and say, we have reasonable probable cause to believe that something is going on here, and we need a warrant to search this person, right, to seize his property, to do whatever. Right? So if you can't meet the probable cause standard, then the use of force against an American citizen must be reasonable, right, which requires an imminent and grave threat. Right. So in order to kill someone, right, so in order for the police, for example, to kill you, right, that you have to be posing an immediate and grave threat to either the police officer or someone in the, in the neighborhood. Right? An immediate and grave threat. These are actually legal terms that both just judges and legal scholars argue about. Right? The implication is there has to be a threat that cannot be addressed in any other way. It cannot be avoided in any other way. It has to be imminent and grave. Right? So if you don't have a warrant, if you, don't have, if you haven't gone through due process, that is the standard uh, by the, the government can use force against you. The Fifth Amendment tells us that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So when you put these two, two things together, right, the Constitution basically says the government can't kill you right, without going through some kind of due process unless you pose an imminent and grave threat to someone. Okay. So that's the, first, that's the first way we have to think about this, right? Uh, what the Constitution, what the Constitution tells us. Right? Now we have to look at the second category is the legal status of the conflict. Right? The, the AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force that I've already referenced, uh, read as follows: right? It authorized the use of the United States Armed Forces against those responsible for the recent attacks launched against the United States, and it authorized the President to use all necessary and appropriate force in order to prevent any future act of international terrorism against the United States. Right? Against those responsible for the recent attacks, so that's important, right? Who is responsible, right? Recent force is September 11, 2001, right? But who is responsible for September 11? As I've already mentioned, that becomes vital, right? To what degree is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula connected to Al-Qaeda? To what degree can, can you say that they are responsible? Right? That becomes a very important question. To use all necessary and appropriate force in order to prevent any future act of international terrorism. Right? If you don't like executive power, right, if you're someone who believes that the president has too much power, Congress doesn't really help you very much. Right? Because it likes to give the president that kind of broad authority to basically do whatever it wants to do. And the AUMF did not specify any kind of battlefield. Right? It didn't say where the president could use force. And we've already seen that the president, um, both Bush and Obama, have expanded the definition and the scope of the, of the conflict into Pakistan. And claiming that well, that's where these people are. And finally, how does it define the enemy? Right? Those nations, organizations, or persons the president determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th or harbored such organizations. 
individuals or persons. So basically, the, the authorization that Commons passed, while it gave some kind of scope to who the, who the proper target was, right, people connected to the September 11th pact, it said that it's the president's job to figure out who counts, right, and that there's no other way to do that. Right? It's the president who gets to determine that. So that's number two, right? What is the legal status of the conflict? And again, as I said, I'll come back and, and, and fill these in. So the, the third category is what's the status of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? Right? And this raises two questions. First, is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula part of Al-Qaeda? Is it covered by that AUMF from September 18, 2001? Right? It's a separate organization, but it's also somehow connected to Al-Qaeda. Right? So is that enough to claim that, it's, that the United States already has an existing authorization and legal right to conduct military hostilities against it? Then, is Amar al awlaki what we would call a belligerent, right? Is he somebody who's actually a member uh, and an active member of, of an organization that is taking part in hostilities against the United States? Right? And again, his role as a, as a propagandist, as a figurehead, right? So, but is he, can he be counted as an enemy combatant or a belligerent? So these are all the questions that I think we need to think about in order to, to get inside uh, the main question, which is can the president kill Americans? So, I'm going to take these in reverse order now. So, let's think about the status of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And to some degree, this is a difficult question to address because so much of this depends on classified information and intelligence that we simply don't have access to. However, we do know that the United States perceives, not only the United States and other Western countries, perceive Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula as a very significant threat. In fact, recently, just there have been a bunch of debates about whether or not Al-Qaeda is dying, whether or not the United States has won the war on terror. And there's beginning to be a shift in attention away from Al-Qaeda Central to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, there's no doubt that, well, that AQAP poses a serious threat to the United States. Right? They are now engaged in what they like to call Operation Hemorrhage, which is a series of small-scale attacks that are designed to, uh, you know, they use very cheap attacks in order to force the United States to do very expensive things in return. So Al-Qaeda actually has a web uh, uh, magazine called Inspire. Right, and the most recent issue of Inspire had a picture of the UPS planes that were subject to those attacks I mentioned before, and uh, superimposed over the planes was the, was the, was the uh, graphic that said $42,000, which is, which is what Al-Qaeda planes cost them to carry out these attacks. And in return, the United States spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in various intelligence operations and counter-responses and things like that. So, and maybe not hundreds of millions of dollars for that attack, right? But Bin Laden has, has referred, or did refer to now that he's doing Bin Laden talked, like to talk about how September 11th caught September 11th attacks on Al-Qaeda somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple hundred thousand dollars, when the United States spent trillions of dollars responding. And so this seems to be part of Al-Qaeda's strategy that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has seized, right? Attacking the United States with small, cheap attacks, forcing it to respond expensively. Uh, intelligence has revealed that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has been seeking to acquire large quantities of ricin. Ricin is a highly toxic biological um, toxin, sorry, uh, highly, highly volatile and very, very dangerous biological toxin uh, that in very minute quantities can kill very large numbers of people. And Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is now uh, also seen to be uh, the inspiration for these lone wolf attacks that are happening now. Um, Major Hassan, the Fort Hood shooter, uh, and then after Major Hassan, uh, Nasser Abdo did this, tried to do the same thing. So, how do we think about Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? It's hard, despite the fact that they have a geographical term in their name, it's hard to think about defining terrorist organizations by geography, right? If you did that, if you simply said that, okay, Al-Qaeda is Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda is in Pakistan, right, that obviously creates a huge advantage to terrorists who would then simply move, start a new organization, and then be a different organization. So it doesn't really make sense, I think, try to define these organizations geographically. Rather, I think you have to think about it operationally. You have to think about the amount of contact and coordination between these various groups in order to decide that they are one the same thing. So, the director of the United States National Counterterrorism Center in December said that these affiliates no longer simply rely upon their linkages to Al-Qaeda and the senior leadership in Pakistan. In fact, they have emerged more as self-sustaining, independent movements and organizations. Now, they still have important tentacles back to Al-Qaeda's senior leadership. But in many ways, especially in the case of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, they operate with a greater level of independence, and frankly, they operate at a different pace, with a different level of complexity than did the Al-Qaeda center. So that seems to at least imply that maybe we need to think about these organizations as being different. In a related terrorism case, uh, 
case brought by a guy named Han Lilly, a federal judge ruled that associated forces count as co-belligerents, right? That essentially, given the, the nature of terrorism, that groups that have sufficient level of tactical coordination can be considered to be part of essentially the original Al Qaeda. Okay. Now, he actually gave us a few guidelines that we can use to think about this question. He said it cannot, right? You cannot use this scope to encompass groups that simply have the same philosophy, the same purpose, or even the same name. So just because someone calls themselves Al Qaeda, right? And when I meant the franchise model, right, you could theoretically just get a bunch of people together, call yourself Al Qaeda, and you would be a member, of, at least in theory, you would be a member of Al Qaeda. Right? That's sort of the way they do it. They allow anybody right now to sort of seize the banner and become a part of their movement. The judge said, no, that's not enough, right? Just because someone calls themselves Al Qaeda doesn't mean they're actually connected to the original group. There has to be an actual association, right? There has to be what we tactical or strategic coordination flowing between these two groups, right? They have to be working together in some significant way. So, how do we think about that, that this question in the al Laki case? Well, in the brief for the al Laki lawsuit that has been dismissed, the U.S. government argued that the United States has further determined that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is an organized armed group that is either a part of, of Al-Qaeda or is an associated force or co-belligerent of Al-Qaeda. So the government is saying, look, we've already looked at this question and we know that, that, that this is part of the original Al-Qaeda. But the problem is, of course, that this becomes self-referential. The government, if the government's the one who's allowed to determine who counts and does not count as a co-belligerent, well, you've got yourself a problem. The government doesn't actually provide any evidence to demonstrate this. In another case, a few years back, you might remember there were a bunch of Uyghur Muslims uh, who live in China who had been seized uh, and brought to the United States, brought to Guantanamo, uh, because they were believed to be members of some sort of terrorist organization. The question was whether or not they could be held. The government was asserting that they were terrorists. Why? Because we say they're terrorists. The court didn't buy that argument and ordered the government to release the Uyghurs. So, the so this kind of argument where the U.S. government basically says, well, look, we've got the evidence. We know that these groups are the same thing. You have to trust us. The courts haven't really liked it. So that doesn't really help us very much. Now, we do know that al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has actually evolved from uh, Saudi and Yemeni-based members of al-Qaeda itself. It formally emerged in 2009. Uh, and now that al-Qaeda's sort of central leadership in Pakistan has been severely degraded by the drone attacks and, and the disruption of its base in Afghanistan, uh, it looks like central al-Qaeda is becoming more, and, and this may in fact change with the death of Iran, but that it is serving more as sort of a central sort of focal point and inspiration rather than a strategic operational center, leaving the operational details to its associate groups. However, there does seem, still seem to be evidence of a formal relationship between these two. In 2010, uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula asked permission of bin Laden to promote al-Laki to, to become the leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And bin Laden rejected the request, thinking that he wasn't, uh, it's not clear exactly why, but maybe that he wasn't sophisticated enough in Islamic ideology to represent the group. Maybe that bin Laden thought he worked better as a propagandist and an operational leader. But then that's the kind of evidence of a strategic relationship, right? Where one group asks the central leadership, you know, can we do this? And it says no, and they respond. In July 2011, the Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula leader pledged allegiance to uh, the new leader of Al Qaeda, Zawahiri, in the aftermath of bin Laden's killing. Uh, and, however, on the other hand, on October 30th, the New York Times reported that the affiliates of al-Qaeda are increasingly growing more independent. So the answer is, this is a really tricky question, right? We don't really know what the answer to this is. The problem, of course, is that there's no one who really has the ability to determine this other than the U.S. government, which, of course, is part of the problem here, is that when we're dealing with these security issues, anybody who's trying to think about these things outside of the government is hampered by lack of information that the government has and doesn't like to share with us. So it becomes really difficult to make these kind of determinations, which might lead you to think, well, that calls for restraint. But on the other hand, there simply isn't any other way to think about it. Really. So we have to do our best. So the status of Al so right, connected to the status of Al Qaeda, then that helps us think about the status of Anwar al himself. And the laws of war are very clear. If you're a member of a force who is engaged in a belligerent activity against someone else, right, that other actor, of course, can kill you. Is. Uh, so any member of a belligerent force is a valid target at any time unless you place yourself in a legal term called hors de combat, which means outside of the hostilities. Right? Which basically means that if you are in the custody of the, of the other power, if you intention, if you expressly surrender, or if you have been incapacitated, right? So if you're wounded, you're 
But anybody else at any time is a valid target. And that's, essential, that's well accepted as the principles of the laws of war. So, if Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is a valid belligerent and is a co- uh, is a, is a uh, co-belligerent of Al-Qaeda Central, and if it is covered by the authorization of the use of military force, and if the battlefield includes him, then Anwar al is a legitimate target, at least so far. Right. Uh, now let's think about the scope of the authorization of the use of military force. Right? As I mentioned, Congress basically gave all the discretion to make any kind of determination about these questions to the President, with a few exceptions. As I've argued in some of my previous work, right, it's important to understand that what we call the war on terror is not actually a war. Right? It's not a declared war, and that actually matters for the legal status of the conflict. Whether or not a conflict is a war, in the legal sense or not, uh, affects the relationships between the powers that the President has to pursue the war, and the civil and the constitutional rights of American citizens in particular. By not declaring, and as I've argued in some of my other work, right, one of the most important war powers that Congress has is by declaring war, it effectively alters the, the relationship between the president and the law and gives the president the ability to make law. What making law really means, right, the definition of what it means to make law, is to be able to alter the legal rights and responsibilities of people covered by those laws. Right? So that's what legislation is. Right? By being the legislative body, Congress can alter your legal responsibilities, statuses, and rights in, under the, in, in this country. Right? That's what it does all the time. When Congress declares war, I argue it gives that power to the president, which means that the president can then take those actions, which normally he could not do because the president doesn't want to make law. However, without the declaration of war, the traditional barrier still stands that the president cannot alter an individual's legal status. So by having the AUMF as an authorization, military force, rather than a declaration of war, the barrier around an individual's domestic civil liberties and, and rights still stands. So, I think it's pretty clear, although again, we don't really know the answers to these questions, but I think it's pretty clear that if al Waqi or another American citizen inside the United States was identified as an member of al-Qaeda, that person could not be targeted for killing in the way that al Waqi in Yemen has been. Because, right, the constitutional protections would still stand. Now, that, of course, there would be the obvious exception for an imminent threat. Obviously, if somebody was preparing a bomb and for deployment, then that might be a little different. But anybody else right, in the United States, I think, could not be targeted. Abroad, however, the question becomes a little more problematic. As al Waqi moves more away from propaganda and more towards a material supporter of attacks, right, his role begins to change and his, and his existence as a threat to the country begins to change. There's an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago. This is a really hard problem for governments. There was a great article about Germany and an and a, a ex-rapper who has now turned into a singer of, of Muslim devotionals. And it's, Germany worries that these songs that he sings are really sort of jihad inspirations, uh, sort of not even not disguised. And so what's the difference between somebody saying, like, the exercise of freedom of speech to exhort Muslims to jihad and somebody who's actually recruiting for al-Qaeda? And Germany's not quite sure what to do about this problem yet. So that's the kind of thing. Right, it's a difficult problem. Right? How do you sort of separate propaganda, which is normally not seen as a grave and imminent threat, and is protected, of course, by our constitutional rights? So you, can have, you, can, you can support communism, or you can even support al-Qaeda in this country if you want to. Right? But at what point does that kind of support turn away from propaganda and actually begin to, especially in a world of lone wolf attacks, when does that become more problematic? So, like I said, so because of because the status of the, the war on terror is not a legal war, constitutional protections certainly in the United States remain, I think, unbroken. Abroad, though, they're a little bit more tricky to sort out. There's a constitutional case known as uh, Reed versus Coburn that argued that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights still and do govern the, you know, the behavior of the United States towards its citizens abroad. Right? So while, of course, if you're familiar with the Amanda Knox story, right, if you were born the hikers in Iran, if you're abroad and you're subject to foreign law, the Constitution still protects you with the ability of the United States to do things to you, right? which would include killing. Right? Now, if the AUMF does not give the President the specific legal authority to violate and alter those basic rights, then the President does not seem to have the basic right to kill someone who he determines to be a member of Al-Qaeda. Right, courts have established that there are six principles Six what we call tests that help us determine the extraterritorial application 
And, you have to, and so when you're thinking about whether or not the Constitution protects you, you have to think about these tests, right? So in, in, in arguing against the extraterritorial, ter, extraterritorial application of the Constitution is the fact that if you're doing something in an area in which there is essentially no le real jurisdiction, the U.S. has no hope of getting legal control of you, which basically means it can't call on a foreign police service to arrest you, then that's something that argues against the protection of the Constitution. Right? The Constitution is a legal is to some degree a legal document. So if you're outside the law, it doesn't really make sense to have protection from the Constitution because you can still do things that are illegal. Right? And the Constitution shouldn't allow you to do that. So since he's in Yemen, that would at least that's at least one argument that maybe the Constitution should not apply. However, arguments for, right, and two of the most important tests, are is the person a US citizen? Right? That, that raises the bar for the constitutional application. And what rights are at stake? Right? The more fundamental and important the rights, the stronger the, the presumption of constitutional application. Right? Obviously here we're talking about the most basic and fundamental right, right? the right to live, literally. So looking at case, looking at sort of standard case law, right, how cases have moved in the Constitution, we might get the argument, might come, we see support at least for the claim that maybe the Constitution should protect al and we should not be targeted. <coughs> On the other hand, cases that have come out of war maybe give us the other argument. Right? People who are affiliated with, to some degree with enemy armed forces during times of conflict have not received what we call normal levels of constitutional protection. So in 1942, during World War II, several German uh, soldiers snuck, uh, took a, a mini submarine uh, and snuck into the United States with the purpose of committing sabotage against the US military uh, and governmental institutions. One of those German soldiers was a US citizen. <coughs> they were caught, uh, and President Roosevelt wanted to try them in military commission for a variety of reasons, one of which is the military commission allowed a much easier uh, path to executing them. And he sued, saying, I'm a US citizen, right? The courts are functional, so you have to put me through the regular legal system. I'm an American citizen. The Supreme Court said no. Right? You are a member of an enemy military, your citizenship does not protect you, you can be tried by a military commission. In 1950, there was another, another case called Eisentroff, uh, dealt with non-resident enemy aliens who were held by the United States outside of the United States. So here we were talking about German soldiers who were German citizens but were being held by the United States. Uh, they then did something, right? they got out and they went to try to continue to fight the war, which was of course over. Uh, and they got arrested again and tried to sue the United States for habeas, right, uh, for basically habeas corpus release, saying you can't hold us because you're in the United States and you don't have jurisdiction over us. The Supreme Court rejected that. Right? And this becomes important because of the problem of Guantanamo, right, in which uh, we, we have to think about what rights does the United States have to hold to the people in their own terror. Finally, the Hamdi case in 2004, right, Hamdi was an American citizen who was a member of the Taliban who was seized on the battlefields in Afghanistan, who was put in Guantanamo and sued. Uh, and sued right? Hamdi was being held as a prisoner of war. Right? Prisoners of war, according to the laws of war, can be held indefinitely until the end. Think about that for a second. When is the war on terror going to end? So he was facing essentially indefinite and at least indeterminate, if not indefinite, detention. He sued, saying, I'm an American citizen, you can't do this. The court said, no, you can do this. You're a member of an enemy military. You can be held indefinitely. Now it did say you have the right to a hearing, to determine. No, normally prisoners of war don't get a hearing. The court said, because you're an American citizen, you can have a hearing to determine whether or not you really are a member of the Taliban. But if you are, you're held forever. Uh, until the, and, and the U.S. actually, they won that, and then, then they released him anyway because he was just a driver and they decided it wasn't worth it. But, but they won the case on the merits, which was that the United States had the right to hold him indefinitely until the end of the Again, the laws of war are pretty clear here too, right? Men, members of an enemy force during armed conflict can be killed without any kind of legal protection, even those who share citizenship with the attacking country. So during World War II, right, if a German had, had run up to an American platoon and said, I'm an American citizen, and even could have produced a document, he still could have been killed, legally, right, because he's joined the enemy military. The enemy is presumed to be trying to kill you. Therefore, you have the legal right to kill them first. So this creates a sort of thorny mess that we now have to sort of think about, right? In Yemen, although he's beyond the reach of effect, uh, beyond the effective reach of law, right, Yemen is close to, if not actually, failed state at this point. Its government is in uh, both the conflict with Al-Qaeda itself and also an internal struggle over 
country. Certainly, it seems to be impractical to apply the Hamdi standard. Right? You can't give this guy a hearing because, well, he won't turn himself in. Uh, and if he does turn himself in, right, the government has said it, it will accept that. But obviously, if he can't turn himself in uh, without being arrested, and so there's not really a chance to have that kind of hearing. Because he's beyond the reach of effective law, because he seems to be mem a member of uh, Al Qaeda and the the question really hangs on two things. One is this relationship between Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula and Al Qaeda. And the other is the question over due process. Right? Has, uh, has, is there, is there, and does there have to be any kind of due process in this, in the process of targeting uh, Al Qaeda himself? And I think that's really the question. Right? The conflict with Al Qaeda, with Al -Qaeda itself has been authorized. Al Waqi is a member of Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. He self pronounces himself. I think that the burden of the evidence does support the argument that Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, at least now, is an associated force or co belligerent of Al Qaeda. And we already have established the principle that the AUMF extends beyond the initial battlefield of Al Qaeda. <coughs> so I think when you put those things together, Al Qaeda is, in fact, a legitimate target. Now, the question is is there still a demand for constitutional protection? We don't, as I said, we don't exactly know how this determination was made. Right? Uh, process is classified and unclear. Just last week, the court ruled that the CIA does not have to respond to Freedom of Information Acts, demanding information about the process of drone targeting, drone targeting and the drone operations, right, because there are issues of national security. So these are basic questions that we're never going to find the answer to, or at least maybe not never, but not now. Right? The court has said the CIA doesn't have to release information. This is all secret. We do uh, believe, at least, that the president has to that when the president targets an American citizen, and he asks the National Security Council, as I mentioned, to sign off. Frontline, the what is that, PBS, the PBS news program began a special a week or two ago on, uh, on one of these questions, and reported that the targeting was to review every six months and are reviewed very seriously. Right? That new evidence is required every six months in order to maintain a suspect on the targeting list. Uh, and, and in the talk, uh, also, as part of that frontline special, there was a, an interview with John Rizzo, who was the acting counsel general of the CIA during the early period of, of the post Olympic period, in which he said that the designation in particular for American citizens was someone who poses a threat to the United States, not to allies, right? and it must be a serious, grave, and imminent threat. Right? There's another American, a guy named Adam Gadan, I think that's how you pronounce his name, I'm not positive, uh, who has also joined Al Qaeda. Who has become a propagandist and a senior commander? He is not being considered for targeting. There was discussion of targeting him, and it was determined that he did not pose a threat because he was purely a propagandist and therefore could not be targeted. And the, the operations he did carry out were very low level, and therefore he did not pose a grave and imminent threat, and therefore was not targeted. So there does seem to be, again, we don't know, but there does seem to be some kind of process in there in which it is actually determined that a suspect added to the CIA's target kill has to be a direct and serious threat to the United States. Again, not to allies, not a propaganda threat, not a problem, but an actual threat, right? which again, al seems to have moved into with his shift from pure propaganda to uh, operational control. So, to sum up, given the nature of conflict and the absence of alternative me mechanisms under the current legal frame, I think it is legal, appropriate, and in fact constitutional for the Obama administration to target an American citizen for killing provided that the American citizen is outside of the United States, in an area beyond the effective reach of legal control and authority, and is determined by the administration to be a member of Al-Qaeda uh, or the Arabian Peninsula or a similar group. Now, I think that this is actually an unfortunate situation. Right? Just because something is legal and proper doesn't mean that it's actually good. Right? I think that ultimately this comes as a result of the failure of Congress to exert any kind of operational control over the conduct of it's the job of Congress to protect and define the rights of American citizens. Right? Not really the President's job to do that. It's the President's job to execute the laws that he has given. Right? It's Congress that passed the authorization of the use of military force that basically said it's up to the President to make all those determinations. You know, if Congress does that, not much we can do. Right? So I think there's two things that we, that we could think about to fix this problem and, and maybe impose better kinds of due process in this, in this kind of situation. One would be to update or amend the authorization for the military force, right? To change it, to give it a little bit more definition, right? To define who counts as a belligerent 
what the scope is. And that might work, but it's I think not a great solution because law is not a very law is not a very fluid or flexible process. And the war the struggle against international terrorism is almost by definition a fluid and flexible process. So sort of trying to legally define at time one what will happen in the future just simply invites either, it either invites continual breaking of the law or the need to continually update it. I think a better solution would be to create a national security court, a special court that is, is empowered to make these kinds of determinations. And this is not a unusual precedent, right? The, the question of warrantless wiretap is done by a, a special court, right? If a court exists that the government believes that it needs to wiretap, uh, and it can't go to a normal court to get a warrant, it goes to a special court, right? And it presents the evidence that the judge determined whether or not the, the, the government's case is valid. And if it is, it allows the government to now this has actually been talked about in other contexts as well. Pre uh, former President Clinton thought that this was the solution to the enhanced interrogation slash torture problems that cropped up at the end of the Bush administration, right? You think you've got a terrorist who knows where a nuclear bomb is, you want to waterboard him? Well, go to a court, show evidence, tell the court what you've got, let the court decide if you've got enough of the case. So this is a solution that might at least be a, a workable uh, answer to some of these problems, right? There, now there is some kind of new process, right? Ask the government to go before a special court. Now, it's not a perfect solution. The court still operates in secrecy, right? There's no chance for the, for the suspect to uh, present his case to defend himself. But at least there's some kind of judicial oversight, right? You at least get the government to present the evidence that it has to a judge and say, here's what we think, here's the bounds of our argument, does it hold up? Uh, and I think that at least helps solve the problems that right now we have a legal answer it's not really desirable answer, right? in which an American citizen, someone who is supposed to be, right, by all rights and purposes, subject to the Constitution, subject to the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, is being deprived of those, pro of those processes. Now that's not to say that he's not an enemy of the United States, and that he shouldn't be killed. Right? But the process is something, right? That's what separates, that's, that's I think, to go back to the Marvel Patrick. Right? That's what it means for a country to be based in philosophy. Right? To think that there are questions that are more important than the immediate political outcome. And that's what the Constitution is. The Constitution is something that transcends right, the immediate needs of the country and says, right, you know, no matter what it is, you, know, you might be better off if the Westboro Baptist Church wasn't allowed to, to pick up the funerals of dead soldiers, but we allow it right, because the question at, at root is more important than the immediate outcome uh, and even, of the, even more important than the right of a father to bury his son in peace. And that's, I think, the same thing here. Right now, it might be legal for, the, for President Obama doesn't really make it good. We need to, and I think we need to think about ways to square that uh, and figure out a better process to uh, for those kinds of extremes.